Praise the Lord. I'm very amazed at what God is talking to me about. And this is going to reverberate through, throughout the earth. We're going to see the most amazing things happening in these days. And I have no interest in preaching a tantalizing message, you know, to get people to shout. Because I notice that some of the people that shout in church will never amount to much at all. Uh, it's really the hungry, teachable, meek, Holy Ghost filled, uh, repentant, hu humble, holy, or you can, um, you can act like you're humble because you're in the realm of being like of, of low stature in your psyche about yourself. So I'm not that impressed with people that act like they're so holy and humble. You know, like my friend Mike Murdoch says something so powerful. The amazing thing that he was talking about was there are laws to success. There are laws to financial abundance. That I'm like, yes, teach me, sir. I'm listening to you. And he's a very rich man. He's been a multimillionaire for 50 years. Yeah, just about 50 years. Uh, so I think he can tell me something about finance. And the Lord has shown him ways to be blessed. Him as an example. And there are other, many others like that. And I'll tell you something else. He said, a lot of intercessors, the people that are in church, are the most broke people. Not because they don't love God. They love God. Not because they don't pray. They pray a lot. Not because they're not concerned about things spiritually. Because they are. Because they don't know the system on how to get blessed. I've never seen people be so illiterate and unlearned and ignorant. I hate the three words and excuse me for saying them. But I want to speak plainly. Illiterate, ignorant, and what was the other one? Irrelevant? <laughs> uh, illeg illegitimate in some arenas? Why? Because, because the... Um, the knowledge of God and the system is not there. I'm really stirred. I'm really stirred with this by the Holy Ghost. I, I am stirred. Father, Father, thank you for this message. Thank you. Think through my speak through my lips. Uh, revelate, revelate. Revelate your own will and plan to the whole earth. Thank you, Lord, that you're going to cause your favor to be released upon this generation and your wisdom and knowledge and understanding to this generation in greater ways than we've ever seen. I thank you, Lord, that you've made me one who's on the edge from the mountaintop shouting down to the earth, hey, hear the word of the Lord and the things I'm speaking are going to help you. Earlier today, I was in a very untoward place. Oh, my. It was... Unusual at best. And um, anyway, welcome to my world. Anyway, the, the, the part of the world, I don't understand a lot of it. And the Lord had me preach to all these babies and young people. I was so excited when I saw the kids and I said, hey, do you understand me? They all went, yes! I was like, woo! I was shocked. And I, and I said, you got your Bibles? Hold up your Bibles. I held up my Bible, and this one kid held something up like that. I looked at it, I was like, what is that? It looks very thin. I looked at it, I said, hold that up again, son. What is that? I said, is that a tablet? He said, yes. I said, you know how to use that? You got the Bible software? He said, yes. I said, how old are you? What did he say? 12, 12, he's 12. And I found out later his name is Blessing. Then there was a little girl, I didn't ask her age, her name was Michelle. 
She's probably about, I'd say she's about nine. She was on the front row on the right side. And when I began to pray at the end, the presence of God came and she began to just be, she was lit up with the presence of the Lord. She looked like a little Catherine Coleman, like a little Amy Simple McPherson, like a little, the, the way she stood and the way I could see the anointing. I said, I prophesied over the call of God is on you. Now, just as I was about to leave, uh, everybody wanted to take more pictures. And these two kids, that came right up to me. Blessing, the boy was here. And Michelle, the girl, was here. And you'll see the photo. I hope it came out. I'm sure it came out well. Because somebody else went out in the middle of the mud over there, outside to step in the mud to take the picture. This is brilliant. There's a whole generation that God wants to raise up, but they need the knowledge and understanding. Adults need the knowledge and understanding, but I found out something that Kenneth Hagin, like Kenneth Hagin, used to, the great teacher used to say. He said, Some, many people's heads are like cement or concrete, well set and thoroughly mixed. It's true. And he'd say something like, uh, bless your stupid heart, bless your darling hearts and stupid heads. I'm trying to help you learn the word. He'd say funny things like that and people would laugh. And he was a sweet man, a wonderful man, a man of love, a man of power, but a no-nonsense gentleman. Filled with God, filled with the word. And he taught the whole generation faith. His own testimonies, how he was healed off a deathbed and blessed so much. And he was never sick again for 63 years until he was 84 years old and he went to heaven. 86, how old was he? He got here when he was 16, and he died in 2004. He might have been 84, 86, mid-80s there. And one day, he just was sitting at the table having breakfast with his wife and whoever else and just went like this, looked up, took a deep breath, and just bowed his head. He was gone. And that's the way he died. Not sick, not sick. Just was his time to leave after a long, full life. But he learned the laws of God. There are ways that God does things. You need to understand that. And if you don't learn them, if I don't learn them, they can't work for me. If you don't learn them, they can't work for you. And I'm going to get into a few things here. On this, the system that God has. The, I could call it the laws of finance and the laws of success and increase. How do these things happen? Do they just happen naturally without any cause or effect? No, they don't. Do they just uh, appear out of nowhere? Do they get absorbed by osmosis, you know? Do they just reproduce like an amoeba cell or a, a the single cell to another cell to another cell and become an organism? Just by themselves? No. There are ways that these things happen. First comes in the, in the knowledge to know the will of God. I'm going to go very fast. I, want to, I can explain each one, but I want to go through the, 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 the list of them first. The knowledge of God, number one, which of course is his holy word. Yes? And then knowledge that we put by revelation in books like this that I've written. Yeah, and the laws of success and prophetic keys to successful living. Books like this, okay? From the Holy Ghost. But first, the Bible. Yes? Ah, yes, yes, yes. And then, the knowledge of God, but then the application of wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. And, and then, in between those somewhere, another point would be the knowledge of God that he wants you to be blessed, but then expanding your own mind and imagination. To take on these things. I'm, I'm thrilled. I'm, I'm telling you, I'm on fire. I'm thrilled. My phones are going, blowing up here. Turn them over. I saw the light flash there. Anyway, they're down here anyway. So, shouldn't have your phone going during a service unless it's boring. 
And I know sometimes I get some work done while I'm in a meeting, if it's a long meeting, but it's definitely not at a time when uh, I'm supposed to be really paying attention. Even Morris Cirillo used to rebuke everybody. Morris Cirillo, the great, you know, evangelist, uh, apostle to the nations, he used to say, don't take notes. He used to get very offended if people were writing. He'd shout at them, stop writing. Listen to me. Look and pay attention. He was like that. Because he didn't, he wanted people to listen to him speaking like they would, he had that, he kept, they'd catch the revelation by listening to him, him talking. Not taking time to write things down and say, put your notepad away. He said, put all your bag and all your stuff under your chair and focus and listen to, to me now. That's one way he did it. So, too many distractions. I wrote a book. I thought so much about the topic. I see if I can find it here. Yeah. And this is, this is out of print already. It's already sold out. We, and we're going to do an expanded version of this called The Focus Factor. It's a great book, but this is... You know what? I gave instructions to people while I was in another, another continent, and it just didn't come out. It's got some things in here that I said, but I have so much more on the topic. We also need to find those series uh, that I did teachings on by each category. Focus... One on excellence, and then other ones, I don't want to go through all the names of them. It's, it's, I, I feel highly frustrated that they're not already like in a systematic order, already transcribed, already to manuscript, already edited to the best way that I can do the final run and put the book out to the world. It's a lot of work, and people, you know, whoever it's going to be that's going to help me with that, they're welcome into my world to help me with this. This book needs to, it's, it's, a, it's a tremendous revelation God's given me anyway. Focus. The only reason people fail in anything is because of broken focus. You don't, you don't focus enough on it and you don't pri prioritize it enough. It's true. And we're all guilty of that somewhere. Everybody. Myself, yourself, every self. Myself, yourself, and every self. I'll just tell you straight out the gospel truth. And I have no... Uh, uh, re regrets or qualms about saying this. I, I don't. I don't. I'll just tell you straight out. Everybody has failed in the in the in the realm of focus and priority, prioritizing, making a priority. There was a lady named Mary Kay Ash who ran the Mary Kay Company, cosmetic company. Uh, she was she was a Christian. It turns out she died in her 80s, some years back. Uh, uh, she was worth about. Well, hundreds of millions of dollars. I think she had a billion dollar company and she's worth about $300 million herself, personally, or more. But this was, this was back in the... This probably analysis was probably back in, done in the 80s or 90s. And she got a formula. She says she'd write down six things to do every day and then when she got to number six, she would stop the day. Someone said, that's not enough. Six only, but you can't even do six. See? You might think I want to attempt, I want to do 100 things, 50 things today, but you didn't do them. She said, and in the order of importance, what's the most important thing that I need to focus on, I need to get done? Number one, I don't go to number two until I finish number one. I don't go, to, this is painful. I'm feeling pain inside, I'm feeling anguish inside of me because I know none of us do it enough. And you uh, don't go to number four until you finish number three, etc. And she said if she got near number six, she was done. Successful day. Someone said, that's too simple. Can I do that? If you did it, you'd probably be a millionaire like her. <laughs> Some guy says to me, oh, it's easy to become a millionaire. I had a meeting a couple days ago. One of the most powerful meetings ever. I, I even saw the Lord appear in the sky uh, over the meeting. That's how strong it was. It's, I, anyway, it's a long... It was several, I couldn't tell the story because the meeting was about five hours, so how could I condense it into five minutes? I can't, but it was so glorious. But this guy said, it's easy to make so much money. I thought, speak on. Tell us how. Tell our people how. You have that revelation. It's so easy. Is it? Okay. I'll accept your word on that. Let's go. But it's definitely going to be Involving a plan, a plan of action. Finance has its laws, number one. Success has its laws, number two. Increase 
breakthrough, expansion, having and attaining more and more and more and more ha, ha, has its own laws, has its own system of operation. And if you do those things, you'll get those things. If you don't, they're still there, they're still available, but they may not uh, be in your possession. And the church sometimes has been the most guilty, and God will hold everybody accountable. Let me tell you, some preachers, supposed pastors, or whatever you want to say, I would not want to be them on Judgment Day, or even now, or any time. The way they fool around with uh, the gospel. Now, if someone's literally ignorant, illiterate, that was the other word I was looking for, illiterate. Illiterate, ignorant, irrelevant maybe. And they really meant well, but they never understood certain things. You could almost say they tried, you know? They meant well. But there are some people that don't even care about applying themselves to going higher. How could you be a teacher unless you're first taught yourself? Scriptural example, yes I will, Ezra 7.10. By the Holy Ghost here. Ezra 7.10 says, Ezra applied himself to study, to learn. The law of God. And then to teach it to others. He didn't say he went to teach not knowing. No, he said he applied himself to learn first. Even Jesus himself was 12 years old. Like this blessing boy in the church. Blessing. He, uh, he's already on his tab. Brilliant kid. He's already like a techno, techno man at 12 years old. Hey. And the little girl there. Maybe she's 9 years old or so. The presence of God was on it. She looked like a a royal, I can't explain it. I can't explain it. I told him, I leaned over with both of them, I said, now one day as you're growing up, you find me, you find where I am, you come and see me. You find me, come a meeting, an event, you come and testify, you come and find me again. They both said, yes, I will, we will. Because the greatness of God is coming upon them. These are young people. These are babies. And little kids, they were like so attentive. I, I was shocked. What I was seeing. I was amazed. It's beautiful. And I said in the message, I said, for this I'm glad I came to see you all here. You, you, you are the product of this meeting. The, me the reason for the meeting and the result of the meeting is you. People. I told this engineer who's brilliant in systems and all this creation of things and industries and all that. I said, that's your thing. I said, my thing is people. Listen to me. And I, I was under such a heavy annoying. I said, my thing is people. People, people, people. I don't understand about all the mechanisms of the business. I'm not doing that. I'm not going to do that. I have no time for that. I have really no interest. I can learn something and see how something works and go, wow, that's cool to know. But I don't know how I'm going to apply that because I don't have time to do that. The first mission, if you want to be successful, if you want God to begin to show interest in you to help you increase, is your assignment. What is the gift of God that is in you that's supposed to go out to the whole earth? What's the talent and gift that God put in you that you're supposed to work with? What is that specific thing that God's given you that, he, that no one else has it like you? I look at certain people that have a uniqueness about them, something great about them, something unique. Cultivate that. Another thing I said, you cannot be, show interest or take time in things that are not the will of God for you to be a, a, a concerned with. Something that's someone else's business is none of yours. Some things are none of my business because I'm not called and assigned to do that. And I told a story about an old man who was a great, had a great ministry uh, I, I don't remember exactly his age, but he, he had thousands of people in his church. Very successful, very vibrant, vivacious ministry. And he got another idea, another and other from another outside source. Another idea to build uh, uh, senior, senior citizen facilities, whatever like that. 
and he went bankrupt because he had no grace from God to do that. And he lost his church, he lost his ministry, he lost money, he, the project, he, and this is a guy that was already operating in high levels of money. So it wasn't like he's going to spend a few thousand dollars here and there. These were huge projects, maybe in the millions. So that crashed and it affected him, stressed him out. He lost everything because he went on into something that wasn't his specific assignment. We need to be very careful with that. Something you look at, say, okay, that's for somebody else. I really can't take concern in that. You understand? This is a major principle of success. Know your role. Know your R-O-L-E. Know your lane. Hi what highway? Know your specific function, the specific race. What are you good at that people look at you and this thing that you're doing and they go, wow, that's an amazing person. And you know when people reach for you? They, don't, they reach for the gift of God or something you're doing or able to do. They don't really care about you personally. I found that out too. It could be a little bit interesting that you think, well, does someone really care about me? You know, a lot of people don't care about other people's issues and problems. They don't care. But what you have from God, the gift that you have, the problem you solve, the big thing that you are, the big thing that you do by gift calling and you're successful in it, oh, everybody loves that, see? So that's what it is. E even God is glorified through that because if you're a vessel of Jesus Christ, which I am, and the Holy Spirit, which I definitely am. What's important that's coming through me is what's coming from God, not me, myself. The angels of the Lord are here right now. I just saw them. Oh, yes. Right straight ahead of me. Whew. Glory to God. Right on that point. What was I saying? And I saw the angel flash right there. That means that heaven is putting, pointing at something. You know the laser pointer on the screen when you want to go to a word, circle the word, or point to a word or a sentence? It's right on that right there. The grace of God that's coming through you is what's important to everybody, not you totally. Now, you could pray the prayer and it's a good prayer. Lord, hide me behind the cross. <laughs> Because it's all about Jesus, you understand? He said, when I be lifted up, I'll draw men unto me. So it's not about a man or a woman or any human. It's about the Lord Jesus Christ. The whole gospel is about him. Everything that he can do and everything that he can bring forth. People need to see him, not you. But they do see you also. So both work together. And God gives people specific interesting traits. There's a certain way they look, certain way they are. He made it like that. He created us. So, of course, people are going to see you, but it's not you that people need to see. It's him coming through you. You understand? There's a young man in a certain town that I was just in on Friday. And uh, he has a church there. And I know he's dynamic because I listen to a few things he says. I don't listen to him all the time. I don't have that kind of time, you know. Sometimes the cultural drama of all the song and the dance and the way church is, it's just... I don't have that many hours to sit and listen. But someone that really has something from God, the word of the Lord is coming through them. I can, I can take note of that. And he, he made a statement that was very monumental that I saw a, a piece of what he was saying somewhere about a particular issue going on. Right now, that's a very uh, a big thing happening right now. And the way he said it was very powerful. He got that from God because he's anointed. So now he has a name, Funny Beard, maybe. <laughs> he has a church somewhere, uh, people around, it's and he has a, I guess he has a fam I don't, family, I don't know. I don't even know about that. But the message is coming through him. So what's his relevance? The fact that God could speak through him. You understand what I'm saying? It's, and now this goes across, the, across the, the whole world in relevance to what you're providing to the marketplace. What problem are you solving? Are you solving any problem? You'll make money from that. And, it's not, and, and again, the end of the matter of things in the gospel is not to make money. If you just want money, 
but you're on your way to hell. If you're a preacher, I don't, I don't know what heaven you think you're going to. If money's your goal, you're making the name of Jesus into a business for yourself, woe be unto you. Because the day will come, you could drop dead and you'll burn in fire forever. And Jesus, you should cry to Jesus, did we not prophesy in your name? Didn't we preach in your name, cast out devils? Can I tell you, the world doesn't do that. They don't even know what it is. They don't know. The world doesn't know what a devil is, what a prophecy is, what a, a preach in your name. What do they know about that? They're not saved. They have no clue what that is. To them, it's foolishness. So they don't even study it. They wouldn't even know what it is. Cast out a devil. What is that? When I was growing up, we thought the devil was the guy with the red horns, the red suit and the horns and the pitchfork and the triangular tail who was on the Louisiana hot sauce bottle, meaning devil, red, devil, flames, synonymous with hell, right? As a joke, hot, the devil on the hot sauce bottle. Because if you put that stuff on the food, you eat it, you're going to go on fire. <laughs> Louisiana hot sauce. Oh, yeah, the devil. That's the devil. What's the devil? We didn't know what the devil was. Church? What is it? I remember when I, when I was growing up, one time on TV, and my family was there, uh, my mom and dad, and we, the TV was on something. Then they had a news clip where they went to a church. They were trying to, probably trying to make a scandal out of one church. I don't even know. I, maybe that's what the, the world news would only show. They, wouldn't, they would never show it for anything good. So this was a long, long time ago. Maybe there was some problem and they were trying to show the church with the camera. The news reporters came. Not, I don't think it was positive, like they're doing a positive expose about how good the church is. I'm sure it wasn't that. I don't remember. Uh, it was so long ago. But, but I just remember this. They show these people with their eyes closed, squinting, with their hands up like this. With some music playing in the background. I looked at it. I looked at my mom and dad. I said, what the is that? <laughs> they looked. They shook their head like. They went like this. We didn't know what it was. Hello. But guess what? They found out what it was later when I got saved and I led them to the Lord. And they're in heaven now. My father's in heaven. My mother's in heaven. His parents are in heaven. My grandmother, my grandfather. They're in heaven. I led them all to the Lord. They, I don't know how they would have got there unless someone led them there, but I did because I got truly born again. Okay? So did we get numbered amongst those people that do this and this? and Yeah, I guess so. But that's not all we do. So the church, I mean, the world doesn't know anything. So what do they know about it? So Jesus was not talking to the world. The people in the church cried, did we not do this in your name? Jesus said, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I don't know you. I don't consider that I've ever known you, which to me is very scary. I've always had a little issue with that part of it. Some scriptures I look at, I honestly don't like. Do I believe that they're the word of God? Yes. Do I take them as gospel? Of course. I mean, you can read it. There it is but I never knew you, it's like, what? Because some people might have seemed like they know, knew the Lord at one time, maybe, but then they went a different direction. So I've always had a little bit of an issue with that, but let's just stick to the one part that seems so obvious. Depart from me, I don't know you. You don't know me, you're not mine, you're not working for me. Isn't that scary? So what's the... I'm saying this for a reason, because I want to I want to also release the fear of God by the Holy Ghost on people. You shake yourself and say, what am I doing with my life? We could teach a seminar about how to get wealth, how to get treasure, and we, we do it. But the purpose of it all is to get money to advance the kingdom. What is the purpose of money and treasures and wealth? When you get this revelation, God can even begin to give you more. It's a law of increase. It's a law of success. It's a law of finance. It's a law of breakthrough. I'm telling you. Because you understand the purpose of money is what? To have more, to do more. Is it a goal in, its, in and of itself? I know one guy is a con man. He's a liar. 
and he, we're, he's involved in some things that are meaningful, and it's, it's kind of a complicated, long story. But something good is seemingly to come out of it. And he's been collecting money in all kinds of ways from people and with this thing. And I saw a vision of a grave for him, and then I saw it again. Saw it twice in the spirit. I thought, what does it mean? In fact, when I first saw it, I was shocked. I was like, oh no, please. You know what? And I, and I want to say more about it. Because uh, God has had me pray for the man and rescue him from death more than, more than three times. He's alive today because of my prayer. Hear God's prophet. He's alive today because of me. That's right. I said it. Because when he was ready to go, he was ready to drop off. The Lord had me release the fire of God upon him and resurrected him. I, I could tell a lot of stories like that. It happened in London, England with the owner of a large television network who I was a live guest on like five or six times. He was ready to die. Twice God sent me. The anointing fell, the glory fell. The power of God came on the man so strong, they had to literally carry him out of the place and put him in a car. He couldn't walk. Drunk, I mean, slain under the Holy Ghost. And he went back on his live show the next day, the next day, the next day, and people were actually calling in and said his name. I almost, I don't want to say his name. I, I, I gotta thank you, Lord, for helping me. And they'd call his name and they'd say his name. Hi, uh, uh, and say his name. Said, you look different. The light, there's light around you. You're glowing. You, there's light coming up. What happened to you? And of course, he doesn't know what to say. He's like, yeah, <laughs> you know. But it was me sent to rescue him. He's alive today. Could have died a couple of times. Jesus said, you'll raise the dead, right? Well, physically dead already, yes. But maybe like those situations too. So I said, if someone has a purpose to do something good, let them do it and then ultimately repent and uh, have the kingdom of heaven ahead of them. That's a different issue. But you play games with money. You play, I got to say this, Lord, you, you know what? This is probably a volume one because I, I want to go further, but I got, I'm, I'm in this part, this introduction here of this topic. You, you got to know the motive and the reason for why you're doing things. What, why do you want to be blessed? So you can be seen, so you can waste it on things, so you can have... Can I tell you, when you're really going to get rich and really do something great and have a lot, God will disillusion your illusion. Your big illusion of grandeur. I'm going to buy this big car, this big house, this big... Yeah, you can have all that. But there's a principle. When it means nothing to you, I'll give you everything. When everything that you think you could have means nothing to you anymore, only my purpose, says the Lord, means something to you, then I'll give you everything. And that's a true, that's a, that's a true, that's a true principle. That's real. And then people that think there's something great. And they should be like uh, worshipped or honored or aggrandized. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, you're not mature yet. You're still a child. You get mature, you don't care anymore about all this. You care about the will of God getting done. So what is the purpose of having great finance to do? Solomon had a mission. He was going to build the temple. David went to get more gold and spoils because he wanted to build a temple that God said you can't build because there's too much blood on your hands for whatever reason. He says, okay, if I, I'll go and shed more blood. I'll go and produce more war to get more spoils that I could pay for the temple. He had a passion to get all those treasures and he went and got them because he had something good to do with the money and the treasures. Sometimes you don't know what to do with your money. You're still going to stay in a certain realm of life. But when you get a mission and a vision, and I said this this morning, I love how this is flowing. This happened last Sunday.
Tap in other Sundays. The morning, God will set the, set the pace. And uh, this right now, the second meeting of the day, we're flowing with some other things, but also there's, there's, they're, 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 they're intertwined and married together. The purpose of everything is to do the will of God. And the vision that God has must come to pass because he wasn't kidding around when he told you to embark upon something and this is his assignment for your life. Hello, hi, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, good day. Are you there? He wasn't joking. So there's this thing called provision. I provide for myself. I provide for my purpose. I provide for my own will. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord provides the ram in the thicket for himself. In the case of Abraham up on the mountain top with Isaac. Up there, sent up to Mount Moriah, up there to sacrifice his son. And then when he lifted his hand with the knife and then the angel grabbed him and said, no, don't do it. Don't harm the lad. Don't harm the boy. Leave him. God said, now I know, Abraham, that you love me above everything else. Even what he had, the most precious thing to him, he was ready to give it to God. Can you be a giver like that? First law is the tithe. You must be a tither. You must get the revelation of the tithe. Let me tell you something. Number one, uh, of, of 100% gets split into two realms. It could be more, but the first two is this. The 90% and the te- from the 10%. 10% from the 100%. So you got 90%, which is right and lawful for you to keep and use, and then you can give offerings, you can, you can give from that, you can do things for your, your, your projects and your life from that. But that, I'm telling you, the Lord has dealt with me this last week again. This 10%, that you keep in your pocket will burn holes in your pocket and in your life. You'll you'll get devoured somehow. Because the tithe actually in Malachi 3 rebuked the devourer. So that 10%, the Lord reminded me, I'm telling you, I'm, I'm God's messenger, I'm his teacher, I'm his prophet, I'm his pastor, whatever you want to say. Someone trying to call me apostle these days, that's okay, whatever. I don't need titles, I just uh, flow in the anointing. And I've been doing this a while. So uh, hear, hear, hear me. The Lord spoke to me again this week. I had a tithe, uh, tithe and, and it was sizable. You know, it was meaningful enough to me. Because I had the money, money comes and then you use it for a lot of things. And you have that, you know, as you're going and that tithe is there. And it was like talking to me, you know. And the Lord spoke to me and said, that tithe that you have there is not yours, my son. It doesn't belong to you. You don't own that. That's mine. I thought Leviticus, my mind started to race. Leviticus 26, Deuteronomy 26, Malachi 3, uh, Hebrews 7. Someone said, is that an Old Testament concept? The tithe, not alone. It's also, read Hebrews 7, talks about the tithe. Read it and study it. Hebrews 7. By the way, before I forget, uh, uh, dear, the prophecy when I was in the street walking, in, in about when I was delivering the word, we talked about that. The anti-corruption thing from heaven, movement. I need that video if we can find it. If you have it in your phone somewhere, we might have sent it back and forth. I saw, it, it pops up in the memories in a year anniversary, and then I repost it. So it's in the Facebook page somewhere, but let, please let's find that later, because every people are asking me for it. They said, wow, if we have that, you prophesied that eight years ago, I think it was 2016, prophesied about this movement of anti-corruption coming in the nation of Kenya. God said it's a movement from heaven. Now we see a movement happening <laughs> with the people out there, Right? It's a movement. And then, can a corrupt system correct itself? No, because the corruption is in the system and in the people. They're not going to stop the, the flow of being able to, you know. So somebody else has to do it. Something else has to rise up. We didn't know it would come like this, but the Lord spoke it. Now we see the manifestation, like many other things we've said over nations, over the, the nation of Kenya, other nations, things years before, even when they were inconceivable. 
Archbishop Harrison Nanga, who wrote the uh, forward to this book and helped, uh, he pub actually published this book for me as a gesture of a seed. What a man of God. What a wonderful man of God. I love him so dearly I can't, I can't talk for half an hour and finish all the sentiments I have about the greatness of this man of God. He wrote three pages about me in the foreword about the anointing we carry, the dilemmas going on in the nation of Kenya, and how God used his servant, the prophet Thomas Matthew IV, to give direction to the nation and walk the nation through certain things and uh, uh, the anointing that we carry. And then he told me after this book was finished, and their publishers uh, did it, did it for me, and uh, printed, printed the big printing and all that. And uh, they're almost all gone. I gotta, we got to go to reprint. I, how many copies we had? Stacks of boxes that would fill a room. They're all gone. They're out. And we're getting down. I think we're in the last box now. We only have a few left. Lord have mercy. But uh, he says... That back in the days of old, the country was in serious dilemma. Everybody was in distress. They didn't know what to think. Everybody was in confusion, derision, to despair. There was so much nonsense, so much evil things going on, so many evil things going on. The country needed direction. And he said, God sends this man of God, myself from America, to come here. And... But we couldn't hear it locally. We didn't know who to listen to. No one had the word, but you came and gave... Why? Because I'm also neutral. I'm not tied to anything. I'm not biased. I'm not from here. I'm not from Kenya. I, what, what interest do I have of this party or that party or this tribe or that or this persuasion or that or this affiliation or that? I have none of those things. And till today, I'm not interested. I take no sides with anyone. I'm on the side of the Lord. What he says, I will say. That's me. I also was getting a revelation a few minutes ago before I came on. I just went to sit down for a minute, and I'm, and I'm on fire. You see, I have a lot of energy here, but I just was, after the meeting, there, I just sat there, and I just was meditating for a minute. I said, boy, I better jump up off of this chair because I could fall asleep here. <laughs> Let me get, I got to go back to do the next meeting. So, but it's okay. Uh, I'm not tired. But uh, the, the, uh, the Lord was showing me about certain key people that need to have friends in their life. But it'd be very, it would be very confident, conf, uh, what's the word? Uh, what's the word you love to use in Kenya? Controversial. You bunch of people. It's very controversial. I wanted to say when I first said that, will you be quiet? Controversial. What are you trying to learn a new word from the English language like you just learned it? I'm going to use it 50 times. It's very controversial. I'm like, what does that even mean? I'm from New York. I'm, I'm as brilliant as lightning. My mind is lightning. I'm very high IQ. I'm very alpha male. I'm very lion dominant, dominant, you know, dominion, dashing, daring, super aggressive, super powerful. My mind's like lightning, and I don't think I've ever used the word controversial in my entire life. Why? Because it doesn't display what I do. Everything I do is right. You know? I don't mean I'm perfect. I don't mean that I'm perfect. Of course, I'm, and no man is perfect. I mean everything, every cause I take, every mission that God gives me, everything I speak from Him, I did controversial. What do you mean controversial? With, with who? The devil? Oh, the devil would hate it. Controversy's in his own head because he's an idiot, because he's defeated, because he came against God and got kicked out forever. So the devil's life, whatever he has left, or whatever he'll do for eternity, is a complete controversy. Contra, opposing, versi, you know? The drama of it all. That's the devil. Good, good little embellishment there on the word controversy. Very controversial. Yeah, so some things we may not tell everybody. Because people say, well, I, 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 an event happened a couple of weeks ago, and I had a man of God tell me the story that they didn't like. People didn't think it was good that this person got endorsed by or ordained or you know, something that, that happened. I, I can't go into all the details. Uh, controver another controversy, as you'd say. And they don't understand that. But, you know, I know the man who did it, and I, I, tr I believe in him, so God must have spoke to him to do that.
I'm sure of it. But maybe some people don't understand everything. You know, people that are stuck in the realm of tradition, religiosity, uh, a certain tradition, a certain cultural drama, a certain way of thinking, system of thinking, they don't understand everything that's powerful. Jesus was a walking controversy in his day, right? How many people did he make mad? Paul made a lot of people mad. Elijah made a lot of people mad. But so what? What they did was right. Controversy. If you use that word a lot, I'm going to question your mentality. I think you're a weakling who's got fear in you. And you're scared of people. And you're scared of being bold. And you don't even know what you think. And you, you, you're stuck. You've been, you've been pickled in some juice of a culture. You need to get out of it. Anyway, I don't mean to preach on that. Controversy. You gotta be kidding me. Don't waste my time. So, he, he Archbishop Harrison Naga said, he spoke, Prophet Manton, he spoke about roads and elevated roads and highways and trains and lines and we were like, what? We thought maybe he was imagining these things, because how could they be? How could this be possible? Now, look, outside of his church on the highway in the city, right above his church outside. I, 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 I looked up one day when I was preaching there. I preached for more than 10, or 10 times, which is a great privilege, because you know, he doesn't invite uh, speakers really to come to his pulpit. But he felt led to have me and he loves me. And God had me prophesy. The things that I prophesied over him and the church and the ministry, they had come in the past. Elevation has come in his ministry. He's been, I'm telling you, the last year, God has taken him even higher. And, and I say that with reverence because he's a great apostle. He was already that from years ago, okay? But now the prophet comes. Boom! Things blow up to another level. He's added 4,000 in attendance to his church on Sundays. He was running, he got up to seven or 8,000. Now he's busting over 12,000 every Sunday. This morning, today, at 12,000 people, probably in each service in attendance, completely packed. And they're expanding the building, and they're expanding it to the front, and they put a few thousand more chairs in there. He told me one Sunday after I preached, he says, up in his office, he said, Prophet, uh, I, I bought a thousand more chairs last week and we put them out Sunday and all of them were filled. I don't know where the people came from. And he had this look of wonderment on his, mind, on his face, expression. You could see the glory of God, but his eyes were lit up. He was looking, he looked at me like, I don't know where the people came from. Can I tell you the day that happened was Marathon Sunday. What a testimony. Marathon Sunday, all the roads are closed. That's the day that people can't even find their way to the church because all the roads are blocked. But they got there that day, supernaturally. Why? Because he's, he has the capacity of a father. He said, he was, I'll tell you a principle about increase for a minute. Let me get, let me get into increase for a minute. And use, use his uh, testimony as an example. He said this himself to me and to others. We were in a leaders meeting. And, he, and, and, and uh, it was just for leaders uh, about a week and a half ago. And he said... Uh, at another apostle's church, he hosted the meeting, who I'd never been to. He's going to have me come speak. A really great man. Really great. Uh, also, a, 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 an anointed veteran in the city. A really great, great apostle. A real man of God. One of the ones that's real and genuine and wonderful. And he said, uh, uh, Wow, I'm honored you'll come because I wanted to connect with him on the phone to find out where the church was. Because the archbishop, I was having a private meeting with him on Wednesday, and he said, oh, by the way, there's a breakfast tomorrow. Just by the way. I said, where? He told me where it was, at this uh, Apostles' Church. I was like, okay. I, got, I said, I'll, I'll see you there. I have to get there. So I had to call him to find out where it was. He sent me the pin, the location, the name. I get there, and Archbishop tells his testimony. He says, I was praying when I was running. We had about 400 people in our church coming. Four, 400 and I started to pray for maybe four or five hundred. And I started to pray for a thousand people. And the Lord spoke to him. He said, God said, you're not ready for a thousand people. He 
He said, God, what? I've given everything to you. I'm here. You know I want to bless the people. We want more people to come because I know they're going to get blessed. The Lord said, no. He said, there's some issues in your heart I still want to deal with. He, this is his own words. And I can relate to this. I'll, I'll tell my own story here. He said, you have this one thing. Uh, you're angry about a few things. He says, you, get, you, have to get, you, have, you have to get past that. It's his own words, his own testimony. I'm not telling anything. If he had not said this publicly over the microphone, I would never share it. I wouldn't feel it was my place to tell uh, something that was private or in confidence. It was a public meeting. He said it. And this will bless the world. That's why I'm sharing it. I thought, wow. He said, okay, Lord, we'll deal with that. We'll deal with that. And he did. And God filled him even more. Next thing you know, he breaks a thousand. Then he starts praying for 5,000 and 5,000 people were there. Hello. Then he says, now we start praying for a church of 10,000. He says, today we're running a church of over 10, by his own congregation, not all the branches that he has. Hundreds and hundreds of churches under his uh, covering. But just his own church running over 10,000 in attendance. Not members, people that say they like the church or they consider themselves a member. In the seats in the Sunday morning service. And they have five services, six a, four, four or five. 6 a.m., 8 a.m., 10 a.m., 12 noon, four services. Every Sunday morning. And the, and the place is packed the capacity. I'll tell you a good one here. He prophesied to me. And he said, God's giving you a new heart. I know what it means. Can I tell you? This was six weeks ago. That he said this? It's July now. What, the, what month was that? What month was that when I was at uh, uh, Good News? Good News. What month was that? Uh, when I spoke at Good News. April? April, yeah, April. Yeah, so that's May, June. Two months ago. He said, God's giving you a new heart. If it's physical, I took it. I got it. If I needed it. But it means in the spirit. And then God's going to send you to all the great men of the world. Another prophecy he gave. He said, he said uh, I see international leaders from all over the world connecting with you. And they're going, to do, they're going to connect with you. Come to speak. Do conferences, meetings. Have a network. You're going to have a whole network. He says they're going to do it because it's Thomas Manton. Because they love you. God's given them a love for you. The connection is there. I see it. He says, I keep seeing it. And he jumped back like this under the anointing. And he laid hands on me. I, 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 it was like heaven was right there. And then he said, you're going to build the international headquarters and have the network around the world. Dag Hewitt Mills, I was at uh, Nakuru, at a son of Archbishop, was John William Kamani, the great apostle. His church is around 10,000, up, up, upwards of, I don't know how many, he has eight, 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 10,000 people in there. What a gorgeous building in the Kuro. I've only been there one time. And he's invited me to speak. He grabbed my hand. He said, I, I, in the right time, in the fullness of time, when the day is right, you're going you're gonna to come and minister here for us. Yes. And Archbishop already told him in his own house, we were together after speaking in a conference, he said, you're going to have the prophet Thomas Manton to come to minister to you all in the crew. He said it. So it's done. It'll be arranged. And uh, the capacity, can you imagine if you have a church that gets to this level, but you also have a son and sons that also have churches like that? It means the capacity in you has gone to that level. Someone lift your hand and say, Lord, please work on me. Can I tell you, it'll never happen. You'll never get to that place if you don't first let God deal with your life. And he talked about this expansion. Now, Dag Hewitt Mills was there speaking. This is what I wanted to say. I almost forgot what I was trying to get to with that. Dag Hewitt Mills, the great bishop, apostle, evangelist, from, pastor evangelist, 
from uh, Accra, Ghana. What a man of God. He, you know, he has like 10,000 churches under him. I, or is it 6,000, 7,000? I don't know. It's like that, that many. And he has branches of churches all over Africa, other countries. The, the man is mega in the biggest way. He had the biggest evangelistic crusade I've ever seen in Kenya. I know we had some of the greats in days of old, local Kenyans, who now have dropped off the scene with that. They're not doing it anymore. A lot of reasons there, maybe, but uh, uh, for whatever. And uh, had crowds like that. But he had a meeting in the Kuru in the outdoor stadium place, whatever, this grounds. And I'm telling you, I looked out. I have pictures from that. I sat on the platform. I cried. I looked and I thought there was like no end to the sea of people. I would almost estimate that there was probably about 200,000 people there the day I was there. I was only there one day. I got a driver in a car to take us there in the morning. We got there, went to the church, the pastor's conference, uh, morning to the afternoon, then left, and I met with Apostle Kimani, and that's when he grabbed my hand at his own headquarters. Where people thought he was busy, we couldn't get an appointment. I don't need an appointment. <laughs> I'm known. I just stood there, I looked at all of them, I thought, y'all protocols, you know they have these protocols going out to the room, oh, everywhere. They're you know, like just, you know, looking like bodyguards. Oh, hey, you know, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So then I just stood there and waited a minute, and then Apostle Kemani comes out, and he shouts at all his protocols, move, bring the prophet. And we stood there for 10, people were scared, I think they were afraid. We stood there for about 10, 15 minutes, and he held my hand, and didn't let go of my hand. And I took his hand, and I put it like this on my belly. He held his hand like this, on his hand against me like this. And we talked for 10 or 15 minutes, I'm telling you. And it was so glorious. And he said, you, you, we're going to have you come minister here. So in the meeting, I went there. Of course, I wanted to meet Apostle Kimani, but it hadn't been planned. But regardless of that, I, when Dag Hewitt Mills was speaking there, I went for him to lay hands on me. I had a mission in the spirit. I wanted him to lay hands on me. That's why I went. So he gave a call. I was sitting on the front row. He gave a call for people to, to give $1,000 for the mission's work. If you want to give $1,000, I thought about it in a minute, and I said, well, whether I have it to give today or not, I will give it. I will absolutely give that $1,000 to his ministry. I will do it. And I stood up, and, and he went, came to me, and he asked me a question. He didn't do this with anybody else. And the place was full. I'm telling you, it was full. There were thousands and thousands of pastors and leaders there from everywhere. Thousands. And he said, you see the, you see the video. You see the places. There's no end to the people. He said, what do you want from God? What do you want? And he gave me the microphone. Can you believe it? Who does he give the microphone to? He's preaching. He's not going to pass the microphone to someone, especially somebody hasn't I, we we had never met. And I and I said what was in my heart, the vision that I have. I said, we're going to build a a global television network and build an international headquarters of the highest order. Yes. And he took the, a big bottle of oil and he poured a bunch of oil on top of my head. It was running all down. He poured it, poured it, poured it, and then took his hand and put his hand on my chest. Boom! And pushed me like this. Now, I didn't fall down, but he just forcefully put his hand on my chest and he said, this will happen by the favor of God. You will see it, you will have it, in the name of Jesus. And the presence of God was so strong, I'm telling you, I, for the rest of the day I was like, I was in another dimension. Then we went to the crusade grounds in the afternoon for the thing, and they had me come up, sit on the platform, right behind where he was, and I'm watching out to the people. There was no end to the sea of humanity. What did God do? to build that level of grace in him 
to reach that many people like that, to flow like that, it's, it's a capacity, I want you to hear me, it's a capacity that he has inside of him. My God, I feel the presence of God right now. Whew. Talking about all that. God will do that in you. This is a law of increase. This is a law of finance. This is a law of expansion. This is a law of success in your work. Especially now if you're in the, you know, in the spiritual dimension, like in the ministry. Let me talk to business people also. And I'm not going to come out of the glory to go down a level to the carnality realm or the natural world of business. Or No, because kings in the marketplace, ministers in the marketplace, you have to be anointed. But what, you know, I want to say this. Someone may be called to do business and have a business system or, be, or have a great career in some arena of an institution or industry or government or in the world. And you're not like a preacher of the gospel. God didn't give you the microphone and say, here, preach to everybody. But you can still speak. You can still have influence. You can still do great in that, in that arena. That people have many different types of callings. If everybody was a preacher, who would, run the, who would run the world? If there wasn't any government, a civil government in a nation, who would run the systems of the country? Could you imagine a nation without a government? Except these corrupt dogs that are stealing the money. God, let me tell you something right now. I, I say this by, as God's prophet. God's going to whip them to pieces. They're going to bleed. Their bones are going to be broken. They're going to cry. If they cry and repent, uh, and moan like a wounded animal ready to die, and then they die, let it happen. Hopefully they can ascend out of their body and go to heaven and not burn in hell. If that's okay for them, let it happen. Corruption. It's a despicable thing. Greed. It's a despicable thing. Can I tell you, you want to be blessed as a kingdom financier, a kingdom person? God will deal with all that in you. You get to the point where, Lord, I need things for myself. I like nice things. And the Lord says, guess what? He is a real revelation. Because I'm not like in a person that's in the spiritual dimension and I don't believe in prosperity. I believe in both. And I believe they're married together for the purpose of God. You, you like nice things. Who doesn't? Who shouldn't? But guess what? We're supposed to have all of them. Freely I give you all things. All things to enjoy. Serve me, Job 36, 11. Let's look at that. Job 36, 11. Uh, you'll spend your days in pleasure and prosperity. Your years and your days in pleasures and prosperity. Look at Psalm 16, 11. At my right hand, the Lord would say, is fullness of joy and pleasures forevermore. God is a God of pleasure. Is there pleasure in any way? If you eat some good food, do you go, ah, that's nice. If a man and a woman are together and they're married and they make love to each other, don't they feel like it's enjoyable and it's nice? Yeah. If you go to the mountains in the, in the Alps or the Mount Kilimanjaro, or you go to the ocean and go swimming in the water and you see the fish and you swim in the water and you see the, feel the rays of the sunshine on you, isn't that enjoyable? Oh, yes. If you see animals, the creation of God, go through the gardens and you see all the beautiful flowers. Do you feel pleasure and joy from that? Yeah. If you can have a good house with good furniture and it's clean and it's comfortable and everything is nice, you should even have your own jacuzzi, a big one, a bathroom so big or a room so big that you could put a full-size jacuzzi. I mean, one that could see 20 people, but you only have it for yourself. And make the water hot, put the uh, salt in there, Put the oil in there, the essential oils, whatever. Throw some rose petals around, whatever. Put some fragrance in the air. Maybe have a big screen TV over there. Come on. Yeah. And sit there and let your muscles be infused with the, with the heat of the water and you can relax. Have your own steam room. Have your own gym. Have your own spa. Have your own industrial kitchen. Have your own chefs. Have your own staff. 
What? To enjoy life. Because a good life will extend your life. God Almighty, I, you know what? If I'm humble, God can tell me. Uh, I, I, I think so. If God, God can tell me you're humble, many people say that about me. You're humble, you're genuine, you're real, you're loving, you're a real man of God. Wow, nice words. Thank you for the uh, aggrandizement. Thank you for the compliment. It's okay, we give the glory to God. But today I walk through the sewers, smelling the stench of sewers in a horrible area, walking through the mud to go to get to a place. And something I saw was amazing. There was a beautiful little boy in the place. Uh, this is in the house now, not the church. And the chickens came in the living room. Chickens. I never saw that in my life. I was like, are these family members? These are relatives. A big rooster walked right into the, right into the house. And the kid was sitting there right with him. I said, well, I wonder if the kid would slap the rooster in his head. He go 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 go. I was like, "What's that?" And I look over, and there's a chicken right there, right inside the house. I was like, "This is some. Well, where am I at? I've never seen this in my whole life." I mean, that's really living on the land, right? But the area. Horrifically disheveled and messed up. Poverty incorporated. So sad. So you wonder why the living conditions affect people adversely. When they're poor, they do. But God doesn't want us to be poor. He wants us to be rich. Are you getting the point? Are you getting the point? Because I want to move on. I'm trying to make a point here. Everything good that God made was supposed to have it. Look at the Queen of Sheba. Look at, let's look at the Bible. The Queen of Sheba came to see Solomon and saw the most splendiferous, magnanimous lifestyle, and she fainted. She couldn't, she couldn't even handle what she was seeing. 1 Kings chapter 10. Now the Queen of Sheba, verse 1. Heard of the, the fame of the name of the Lord with Solomon, and decided she would go there to even ask him hard questions, to make an appointment. And like the Bible says, a person's gift makes room for them. She brought camels, burdens, trail, train, you know, carts and trains of, with camels pulling them, worth of all kinds of stuff. Somebody did a study and they said that what she brought was worth between four and twenty million dollars. In the estimation of today's money. And this study was done years ago. It's not now, so it would be more. I heard someone say one time they thought it was about a million dollars. But then I heard other people say, more, more specifically, all the things that she brought were worth about $4 million, maybe even upwards of $20 million. Because she brought precious stuff, gold and God knows what else. Maybe precious gems. To get an appointment with the king. So I think that Solomon was not expecting her. And when they saw these camels, burdens, trains of camels coming toward where the palace was, the, the, the men working there looked out and saw and said, well, who is that? They don't have an appointment. Go see who they are. Tell them to maybe tell them to go away. And Solomon might have come out the door and looked and saw all that and said, who's that? Oh, it's this lady. She says she's a queen uh, uh, boss. Uh, what should we do? He said, tell her to come. <laughs> if not just for her alone, maybe he saw all the stuff and he was very curious. And maybe wanted to even say, okay, this will, this will honor God. And she came in and she couldn't handle what she saw. What kind of life is that compared to what I just was seeing? You see the difference? And yet we say Solomon's our father. David's our father. Abraham's our father. Jehoshaphat's our a leader from the Chronicles. He's... Job was a multi-billionaire. Moses 
was the one that put up his hand and said, God, stop. We can't process all the blessings you're already giving us. God had a pause, the blessing flow, the blessing factory. Because Moses said, God, please let us process this for a bit. We don't know where to put everything you've given us. Now, I have to ask you, who do you know in town or around that has that testimony? They have too much stuff that they don't know where to put it. I'm waiting for all the amens to finish. There are no amens. Silence in heaven for half an hour. You don't know what to say because you've never seen it. I found a scripture in, uh, I'm going to close in a minute, I think. I think I'm getting there. Second Chronicles 21, 12. And a letter came to him to, who was it back there? Well, ah, yeah, yeah, these other guys. Edom and I'm saying some bad things about what they were doing. Not good. But a letter came from him from Elijah the prophet. Elijah. A letter came from Elijah. Really? It says Elijah. A lot of people may not know that Elijah wrote a letter. Well, here it is, if it was him. If it was that prophet Elijah. Elijah. A letter came, to, came from Elijah the prophet saying, Thus says the Lord, God of your father David, because you have not walked in the ways of Jehoshaphat, your father, or in the ways of Asa, king of Judah, but you've walked in the way of the kings of Israel, which were leading people astray, and you play the, the harlot, and you've killed your brothers and done evil things. And he said that the Lord will strike your people with a serious affliction. You see that? So people wonder why all this poverty. Poverty is birthed by father Satan and mother sin. They come together and produce a, a realm of devastation. It also comes from ignorance, unlearnedness. It comes from sin. It comes from curses. And all of it's unnecessary because God never ordained that for people. He never desired for people to live like this. So I like this. I, I like that I, the Holy Ghost had me find this. You didn't walk in the ways of Jehoshaphat. We can do a whole study if we were to look into it. What were the ways of Jehoshaphat? King Asa. King Asa was brilliant because he's the one that knocked all the idolatry off the high places. 1 Kings 15. Asa came in. And he, he destroyed those demonic uh, idol-worshipping things and whatever, all those things, from the high places. He removed all of them and said, now the glory of God has to come back. And God began to move. And even his own mother was one of them. There was something from the mother and the grandmother. And you read it, the matriarchs there, they were in that kind of stuff where they had some wicked things in the high places. And Asa said, no, all this needs to go. In the ways of Jehoshaphat and the ways of King Asa. Asa, the king of Judah. Here it is. He says, because you did all these evil things, he said, the Lord will strike you with a serious affliction. And he began to name some of what they were. What was the choice that they had? Walk in the ways of Jehoshaphat. I want to just make a note of that. We'll look at it more later. Or somebody can look through it and help us out with it. What were the ways of Jehoshaphat? Jehoshaphat was brilliant. Jehoshaphat, we see in Chronicles, he was, First Chronicles, the, the stories of Jehoshaphat, he had exotic animals, he had land, he had gold, he had businesses, he had ships, he had import, export, he had, so did Solomon. Solomon was going to fetch gold. They wanted to get gold. And he sent his servant Hiram. And then Hiram didn't even go. Hiram sent the servants to go. And they brought the, the gold on the ships of Tarshish, whatever, to Tarshish, the gold of Ophir. They went and got the treasures. Now, Solomon didn't have to be there. His assistant, his assistant Hiram didn't have to be there. 
because there was such a system of excellence. And this is, some, this is a law of increase, a law of success, a law of finance, a law of increase. You have to have a system put in place. And on that note, I'm gonna, I want to sum, sum it right there. And I, wanna, I want us to pray over that. The system, the systems, the laws of God. Are you hearing God serving you? Need to be put in place. Without a system, how can you build anything? They had the systems. So the servants were so in awe of the leaders that they would never steal part of the proceeds, lest a curse would come upon them. Look at Judas Iscariot. He wanted, to, he wanted to betray the Lord. He wanted to steal from the treasury. How did it end up for him? The devil, the Bible even says, the devil, Satan himself, entered the body of Judas Iscariot. What opened the door? Just the fact that he was going to do one act of betrayal? Oh, yeah. But before that, he was a thief. So he had something leading up to that that was invoking and inviting the devil into his world. I want to say to everybody, if you're not a tither... You better understand something here, according to the word of God, that that 10% of what you get is not yours. I don't care if you're broke. I had a man of God, one time the electricity went off in his house, he was in the shower, and everything went black, and he screamed, ha! Ah! And his wife was downstairs or somewhere in the other part of the house. He said, why didn't you pay the electric bill? Because he could see that the power went off. And she shouted back, she's a very strong woman, she shouted back at him, because there's no money to pay the bill. Then he thought, and he started to laugh. He said, I just paid my tithes and offerings. <laughs> and he was busy, you know, so he made sure he had to do that. Maybe he didn't do it first. He was doing it in conjunction with paying the other things. But he, but he made a statement, and I'll never forget it. He's a dear, a man of God who's a millionaire today. Listen to me. He's a millionaire. He's a multimillionaire. His ministry budget is running at $25 million a year right now. He's gotten to that. That's $2 million a month. That's $500,000 a week. Yeah, that's $100,000 a day. I per day is flowing like that supernaturally because he lived by these principles. And he made a statement, and I'll never forget it, and I want to tell it to you. Because it's a, it's a principle of God. He said he would rather die than not pay his tithes. He, he would rather have nothing. He would rather be in darkness trying to find his way out of the shower and hope he doesn't kill himself on the way out. He, he didn't care. He just started to laugh. Lord, I don't care. I paid my tithes and my offerings. Was his electric going to stay off? No, he find a way to pay it. I'm sure by that day or the next day. Temporary things. I, I, I know sometimes when I gave certain things and I felt like a big thing I was doing and then I look back on it now and I think, Does, is it relevant now? Did I need to keep that in my life or did I need to give it? Plus a tithe, I wanted to say this from earlier, I have to say this now. It's part of this teaching here right now. Your tithe is not something you give. When you give, you don't give your tithe, you pay your tithe. It is a, an obligation. It's a kingdom tribute. You give that piece, that 10%, you take it back from your pocket and give it to God in honor of his word. And he'll bless you for that. He said what? I'll open up the windows of heaven, Malachi 3, 10 to 12. I'll pour you out a blessing that's not room enough to receive it. I'll rebuke the devourer for your sake and I'll make you a delightsome land for me, says the Lord. Those four major blessings. And then to go back to the eighth verse, ninth verse. He said, if you rob me in tithes and offerings, if you don't do these things according to my plan and my will, a curse is added to you, to your financial life. That's the word of God. And I had this going through my, 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 my mind and spirit the uh, uh, last couple of months. You know, the Lord's given me more, uh, a further solidification of, and more revelation on this. I thought, is the word of God true or not? Did he say he's going to open up the windows of heaven and pour me out blessings? Did he say it? He said it. Will he do it? Rhetorical question. Will he rebuke the devourer? He said he'll do it. Will he do it? 
He'll make me a delightsome land for him. Will he do it? Absolutely. Do I want that? Then I have to do the condition. Proverbs 11.25 says, A generous person will have a blessed life. A generous one. The generous one. The one who is always there to give. Always there to do something. Always want to sow. Want to make sure you're tithing. You're offering. You're helping the poor. You're giving out. You're doing things. You're working the biblical economic system. The laws of finance. According to the kingdom of God. According to the word of God in the kingdom of God. In obedience to the Holy Spirit because he's the author of all this. He's the one that had all these principles written for us. The Holy Spirit. God himself. God Almighty, this is awesome. Thank you, Father, for this. He said, I'll do all these things for you. Oh, God. The generous person will have a life that is like a well, and becomes, literally, becomes a well-watered garden. The garden is there. The things are planted. The things grow. The water comes. You know, the scripture says like, some sowed, some watered, and God gave the increase. And the work of the gospel in the, in the book of Acts. The increase coming from God, does it come or not? It does, if we work according to his principles. So also, you need to have a good spiritual father. You need to be in right relationship with the right people. You need to remove the wrong people from your world. You need to create a great atmosphere. You need to create a great uh, environment. Amen. You need to fill yourself with the word. Uh, uh, Dr. Paul Enetje, who's a really tremendous uh, apostle, he said something at a meeting he was doing in America. I was watching online. He said the scripture that says, I, uh, wherever the scripture was, I, I got to look it up again. It says, I, I esteem God's word over even my necessary food. You know that scripture? I esteem the spiritual things, the power of God, above even my necessary food or life. So he said, he said he had this thing happening in him for years. And you notice he's a very skinny man. He has no body fat. He's like uh, the frame of the man with skin on it, and that's it, and his suits. And very thin. He has no belly. He has none. Straight down all the way and thin. Why? Wow, you know, he, he's not a... He's not a man that's living to eat. He's probably just eating to live and he's about the father's business. I understand that. Well, I lost so much weight myself. My, I was telling someone the other day, if I don't keep pulling these strings on my pants, my pants could just drop off because I, I, I got to keep pulling them tighter and tighter. The belt is running out of holes. You know when the belt runs out of holes, you got to keep going more because you've gotten so, so skinny. And he said, I got this thing in me that I wouldn't eat anything until I filled myself with the word. I had no appetite. He said, I had no appetite. I didn't want to put anything in my mouth at all. I didn't want to eat anything. But I just wanted to fill myself, fill myself. And when I've, when I've done, and he, he does this all day long. And, and he has meetings like that. He also has five services on Sunday. <clears throat> he said one time he was praying five hours and he needed another breakthrough, a level of breakthrough. And God didn't tell him, oh, I'll do it for you. Don't worry about it. He said, increase your prayer to seven hours a day. He said, God, we're already praying five hours a day. Five hours a day. He, God said, increase it to seven. And when he did, what he, what he couldn't get past happened. All his services got filled. And he went to five services and all of them were filled. He said there were two of them that were all not filled. And then he, one, he couldn't get certain, past a certain threshold. He said when he increased the prayer time, it just, it, 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 that ceiling lifted. Now he's built the largest church building in the world. Seats almost 100,000 people inside the church. Why, how did he get to do that? Land that they said couldn't be found. He had it in his spirit because he heard from God. God kept telling him, it's in this area, it's in this area. Look again. No, there's no property available. The prime district of Abuja near the airport couldn't do it, couldn't get it, couldn't get it. They found hundreds, 100 acres, or how, I don't know how much it was. How much land it was, a huge piece of land. It was there, hidden somewhere. 
it, it unveiled itself. Can I tell you, I was, I was with the, uh, the servant of the Lord uh, on, 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 on Friday, Friday morning. We had a meeting, private meeting. And he said, when I told him some of my plans we were, that the Lord's dealing with me about, he jumped like this and said, yes, yes, yes. His wife was sitting next to him. He jumped up. He almost leaped off his seat behind his desk. I was in his office. And he said, things may look, a lot of time has elapsed. He said, things may look like everything's gone, everything's not so available. But he said, God will give you your place. God has a place for you. I said, yes, I, that's, that's the word of the Lord. It'll, it will happen because you said it. How? Connection. How? Covenant. How? Walking with God. How? Development. You see these things? There's a lot of people are out there and they never seem to break. If you want to break the environment you're in to a higher level, you have to connect with a higher environment. You have to apply yourself to all these things. Father, I thank you for this teaching today. Lord, let, let these words become reality in every person's life. Let them work with it. Let the, let, the, uh, let the people, uh, your people, begin to receive the realms that cause expansion, the realms of things that cause development and breakthrough, that we go higher in finance, we go higher in success, we go higher in increase, promotion that comes from the Lord, expansion and favor and new things. And these are really happening for us now. In the mighty name of Jesus. I am Thomas Matthew IV. Of course, I approve this message and I release it unto you in Jesus' name. Your tithe, your seed as the Lord directs you. Do what God tells you to do. Nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. Exactly what the Holy Spirit is telling you to do. And so, the information on how to sow is on the screen right now. And the phone number, if you'd like to get our books, you'd like to get uh, information, you'd like to receive prayer, you'd like to communicate with us about upcoming events, you'd like to be part of our family, the Dominion Tribe, I affectionately call us, the Dominion Family, you'd like to be part, you want to be a partner of the ministry, you want to sow into this anointing. I'm telling you, something else I had strong in my spirit. A seed is not something you pay somebody for. A seed is something you sow. Some people, when you tell someone, sow a seed, if I say that to somebody, and I said it to people earlier today, that's what we mean. It's a seed for yourself. It's not like you're paying for something. Know the definition of a seed. A seed is something you plant and then it grows and you, reap, you, you, you gain a harvest from it. It's not a payment. And the power of the tithe has four promises that God gives on it. Open up the windows of heaven for you. Pour you out a blessing, not room enough to receive it. Rebuke the devourer, the devil for your sake. Give you protection and rebuke everything that eats away at your life. And makes you a delightsome land, a delightsome entity in the earth for him. Wow. So nothing you do in the realm of Getting involved with God's biblical economic order will leave you hanging and leave you in loss. It all increases. Even when you give to the poor, the Lord says he pays you back the same money you gave. You pity the poor, God will pity you. You help the poor, you give to the poor, God will give it right back to you. What you give to the poor, you lend to the Lord and he will repay that to you. Now if you want to increase in multiplication... You sow for that. If you want all these things, the devour rebuke, the windows of heaven open, great and magnanimous things, give the tithe, pay the tithe, put it in. Take the tithe and put it into the storehouse. But I'm becoming more of a storehouse and it will become more in the days to come. The Lord is talking to me. The Lord spoke to me two things this morning, three things this morning when I was in the elevator. You call it the lift, whatever. 
from the high floor down. I only had a few seconds because the elevator goes fast. The Lord spoke three things to me in split seconds of time. I got it. I got it. I got it. To train leaders, to have a certain group of amount of people with us, working with us now. To bring certain kind of people and uh, and something else about uh, some high dignitaries that we're, we're going to connect with. And just show them God's love, you know. There's a reason for everything. In God's, in God's uh, order of things. So the ways to become a partner are there. Western Union MoneyGram, the old way to send. You can send to Thomas Manton. And the WhatsApp number is on the screen. And the telephone number from around the world. It's on 24 hours a day. Plus 254-706-164191. That is the phone number. Send a WhatsApp and SMS text message. If you call, you may not necessarily get us because we're in a lot of meetings and we can't always grab the phone. Uh, I guess during business hours at times it'll be more on and we'll add other phone numbers where you can call the office uh, real soon uh, and there'll always be someone to answer the call. But this number is like a direct hotline. I'm giving you a real blessing. I'm giving you a secret. It's a direct hotline. And you send a message, I will see it and be able to respond accordingly. Take advantage of that. Make use of that. It works on the M-Pesa, SendWave, World Remit, M-Pesa, 0706-164-191, sow a seed. And if you uh, feel like you're, you're a part of this family and you're tithing, I mean, just, just do whatever God directs you to do, okay? And everything is for the purpose of increase for you. You must work the biblical economic system if you want to be blessed economically by God. If you want Him to be the one blessing you, and you want His blessing, you have to do things His way. Amen? And uh, increase and success are just part of the program. We need to go higher and higher and higher. Every day we're attaining more. But God wants to work with us to make us his own vessels. Let's pray as we're going out of here. Father, thank you for the grace, the fire of the Holy Ghost coming upon everybody right now in Jesus' name, in new ways. The touch of fire, the touch of your glory upon your sons and daughters that they will increase and prosper and get ahead in life. Get further on in life. David saw the enemy and he got ahead. He got Goliath's head first, and then he got a hit. He took an act of, uh, uh, seized the moment of the opportunity to take out that, that uncircumcised, foolish Philistine, cut his head off. Then he became the, the, fame, the famed one of the land. He even made Saul jealous. When the people cried out, Saul has his thousands, but David is tens of thousands. He's our prince. He's our favorite. Saul got jealous and enraged at David. But did David get raised up? And Saul, the kingdom was taken from him because he was disobedient. He was a rebel. He was a proud, arrogant one. And he lost it all. But David humbled himself and kept walking with God. And God said, you're a man after mine own heart. And I'll bless your house unto a thousand generations. That was our David, our king. Is Saul our king? Mm. No. He's with the witch of Endor. You read the scripture. He's, he's down there with them. Oh, it's terrible. But David, one of the 24 elders in heaven, is David. I'm sure. Abraham is. Moses is. Come on. That's three. 21 more. Who are they? Maybe Elijah. Maybe Enoch. Apostle Paul. Apostle John. Should I continue? And I want to be with those guys myself. I want to live in the best part of heaven, the best neighborhood. I want to have my mansion on Billionaire's Boulevard. Uh, glory, the Glory Way, the Glo Glory Avenue. I want to be there with the, with, with, the, with the obedient servants of God. 
You can ask for that. You can ask for that. But how much you want to do in utter desperation to share this point from my heart. I feel a desperation to say it. And important to say it. You'll never hear well done if you didn't well do. Well did, well, you did well, you've done well, now you can hear well done. So we have to get busy about the Father's business. Now, does increased success, promotion, prosperity, finance all play a part in that? Absolutely, because, absolutely because it's provision for the vision. And without it in this world, what can you do? But the ways to get there is the ways to operate. Work the biblical economic system. Build a system of operations for your business, your ministry, your life. Get into that. Build the organization that God is challenging you to build. Build things according to his will. Get smart in those areas and apply yourself to them and let it produce for the glory of God. In Jesus' name, I pray this over you. Some people don't have a system. They don't have enough direction. They're not passionate enough. They're not working hard enough yet in the thing that God's ordained. That's why there's the struggle. If you elevate your mindset and you get in the presence of God, you can't stay in poverty. The first thing I saw when I said, saw certain people in an event I just did, I said, you must move from here. And they said, yes, the prophet has spoken. We, we accept. Move from here. Move out of here. Everything. Change it all. But I hope they'll do it. I trust they will. Upgrade everything. To say, don't worry about money. Don't worry about Worry about vision. Where does God want you to be? Because what ult is the ultimate expression of you in a high level can't be from here. So find it. And then the Lord had sent me to speak to Who else would tell them that? So, we give God the glory for everything, in Jesus' name. All right, I'll talk to you on the next broadcast. I'm praying for you. Write me, sow a seed. And as I'm hearing from you, I'll consider you my friend and partner in the ministry. The Lord bless you, keep you, make his face to shine upon you, and give you his peace, and also his power, and his prosperity. Get ready to be blessed, because you're going places. I declare it so in Jesus' name. I'm Thomas Banton the Fourth. See you on the next one. Have a great day. Great day, great day, great day. Make it a great day. Talk to you on the next one.